So the first part of any good data science project is exploratory data analysis. That's exactly what we're gonna be going through in this video with Pandas, Seaborn, and Matplotlib. Alrighty, so we're gonna be going through a couple of key things today. First and foremost, we're gonna cover how to load data into Python using Pandas. We're then gonna perform some exploratory data analysis. So we'll calculate summary statistics, we'll visualize unique values and a whole bunch of other things. And then last but not least, we'll also visualize our data using Seaborn and Matplotlib. So we'll analyze our trend and we'll also calculate some correlation statistics. So in terms of the specific scenario that we're going to be tackling, we've got a bit of a mock scenario set up. So a business has approached us with some data and they wanna be able to forecast transactions. So specifically the data that they've given us are a list of accounting transactions. So in there, we've got accounts, we've got cost centers, and we've got a year and a month column. So what they wanna be able to do in the end run is be able to predict what the value of each one of those specific accounts is going to be in the future. Ultimately, what they wanna be able to do is take the machine learning model that we build and integrate it into an app so they can expose it to their front end business users. So all they need to do is click a few buttons and hit predict and have their prediction shown to them. So there's quite a few moving parts to this particular scenario. So we're gonna start off with exploratory data analysis and we'll also cover the Chris DM model. If you've never heard of the Chris DM model before, don't stress, we're gonna to cover it in the video a little bit later on. Let's get to coding. Alrighty, so as mentioned, the goal of this entire machine learning regression series is to be able to build an app that allows a user to enter in some fields, hit predict, and get a result back from our machine learning model. So really, this entire series is going to encompass the entire data science lifecycle, all the way from business understanding, all the way through to deployment, and finally integrating it into an application. So in terms of our app or the app that we're going to be building by the end of the series, we're going to be able to choose a particular year. So in this case, I've chosen 2022, choose a month, choose a cost center, and then choose an account and hit predict. And what I'll get back is a machine learning prediction. So in this case, because we're using regression, we're predicting a continuous value. So you can see here that as a result of choosing these particular fields, so 2022, April, cost center CC 200 and account 3 million and hitting predict, I've got a result of $374. So if I wanna change this, for example, to a different cost center, so say CC 301 and hit predict, then I should get a different prediction. And you can see that that prediction has been updated and we can also see it in our visualization. So we'll be covering building this app right at the end of the series. For today, we're gonna to be focusing on the first two rungs of the CRISP DM model. So business understanding and data understanding. So let's jump into a Jupyter Notebook and start laying out the framework for our machine learning model. So in this case, I'm just working inside a Jupyter Notebook. So all I need to do is hit new, hit Python 3. Now, first thing that we're going to do is name our notebook. So we'll call it regression model. And then good practice whenever working in notebooks is to include lots of documentation so that others can pick up your notebook and so that you remember what you've actually gone and done. Now, in this particular case, what we're going to be doing is following the CRISPR-DM model of data science. Now, if you haven't heard of the CRISPR-DM model before, the best way to remember the steps in it are to remember this initialism. So Barry drove directly to the medical emergency department. Now, each one of these represents a step in the data science lifecycle. So ideally, these are steps that you should consistently take whenever you're performing any machine learning project or any deep learning or machine learning task. Now, each one of these represents a key step in the data science and machine learning lifecycle. So specifically, they stand for business understanding, data understanding, data preparation, modeling, evaluation, and deployment. So each one of these steps sort of ensures that you get a good machine learning model and you set yourself up for success as part of your data science project. So let's just add those into this particular cell and lay out our notebook so that we've got that structure set up. All right, so that's our framework laid out. Now, the first step in this is actually business understanding. 
So there's no code actually involved in this particular business understanding step because it's all to do with understanding what our end outcome is. Now, if we actually step into this cell, let's add in a few notes. So in this particular case, a business has approached us and asked us to help out in forecasting their accounting transactions. Now, because we're looking at transaction values, we know that this particular task is going to be a regression task because we're trying to predict a continuous value. So we can add in a few notes to help us remember what our business understanding step is. So in this particular case, our company has also told us that they've only got data for roughly three years and their data quality is okay, but they're not too sure. All right, so that's our business understanding step done really, really quickly. Ideally, when you're performing this business understanding step, it's really good to speak to people that are working within the business and find out what factors are influencing certain outcomes. So in this case, we've just done a quick business understanding walkthrough. Now, our next step, which is going to be the main focus for this video is our data understanding step. So as part of our data understanding step, we'll read in our data, we'll start pre-processing it, and we'll also use some visualizations to get a feel for what we've actually got on our hands. Now, the first thing that we're going to do is bring in our data set. So we can do that using pandas. All right, so we've brought in pandas. So we've used the import function to bring in pandas as PD. Now we can use the read CSV function to bring in our data set. So in this particular case, the data set that we've got is one CSV and it's just called regression.csv. So that's all we need to pass. Okay, so we've successfully read in our data set, but you can see that we haven't actually started looking at what our data set looks like yet. Now, the first thing that you should almost always do whenever you bring in a data set is just run the head function. So this is gonna show you the first five rows of data. Perfect. So as the business was saying, they've got some accounting transactions and it looks like we've got a year dimension. We've also got a month column, a cost center column, an account column, an account description, account type, and our amount column. Now on first observation, it looks pretty clear that what's going to be our target column is going to be amount. So we're gonna be trying to predict amount and our feature columns are gonna be all of these here. So year, month, cost center, account, account description and account type. We can also take a look at the last five rows within our data set using the tail function. Perfect, cool. So it looks like we've got a bunch of different types of accounts. We've got data up until 2021, which seems pretty consistent with us having three years worth of data. Uh, and looks like we've got some different cost centers, some different accounts as well. So you're starting to see that a large part of data understanding is really working out what data we've got on hand and checking to see if there's any issues in it. Now, one of the things that's really important whenever you're performing any machine learning project is to actually evaluate the quality of your data. Now, one good check to evaluate the quality of your data is to see whether or not you've got any missing values within your data. So this is a pretty easy check using the df.info function. So we can just type in df.info, and you can see that it looks like we've got no missing values. So everything's saying non-null. And it looks like we've got 4,212 values within our data set. So now another good check that you can perform is to check the uniqueness of the values within your columns. Now this gives you a feel for how many different types of categories you're gonna have within your data. So we can do that using a quick loop. So we're just gonna loop for, through our data frame columns. So if we actually just access the df.columns value, you can see that this is just going to return an index of all of our columns. So you can see here that we've got year, month, cost center, account, account description, account type, and amount. So these just correspond to the columns that we've got up there. Now, what we can do is we can actually loop through these columns. And from there, we can actually check the uniqueness for each one of these columns. So if we were to do this for one single column, we could just type in df, uh, what's a good one, uh, account dot unique. And you can see, we've returned an array of unique values. So this, this is a complete list of all the unique accounts that we've got within our data frame. Now, rather than doing this for each individual column, we can actually just loop through them all and print them out to the screen. Perfect, cool, so that's done. So you can see that we've printed out the name of the column, how many unique values there are, as well as an example of all of the unique values. So you can see here, 
in our year column, we've got three years as the client promised. So we've got 2019, 2020, and 2021. In our month column, we've got all of the columns there. So we've got January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, and December. So what we might do later on is we might also convert some of these months into a period index. So rather than using the, the word, we might also convert them to a numeric value for visualization. So that's just a point to note when we're, as we're going through our data preparation step, uh, we can see that we've got a number of different cost centers. So nine, few accounts, we saw that already. Uh, we've also got a few account descriptions. Now you can see here that our account descriptions, the number of our account descriptions matches our number of accounts. So this potentially tells us that we've got two columns which represent the same style of data. So later on when we get into our data preparation step, we might choose to drop one of those columns. Uh, account types, so we've only got four different account types. So revenue, expenses, assets, and liabilities. And then amounts, we've got a whole bunch of different types of amounts, so that looks fine. The fact that we don't have the same number of amounts as transactions potentially tells us that we have some line items which have a similar value. So at some point in time, we might choose to remove some of those duplicate values or evaluate whether or not they're actually adding value to our data frame. All right, now that we've done that, another good check is to take a look at the spread of our data. So we can create some summary statistics using the df.describe function. And this is really just showing up our numeric values at the moment. So if we actually check our data types, you can see that it's only calculated for our year account and amount. So it's excluded our month, our cost center, our account description, and our account type. So in terms of our year, this really isn't all that relevant. We, we, this is really a categorical value. Uh, in terms of our account, it looks, uh, again, that's a categorical value. In terms of our amount, so this is good to know. So our minimum value is $1,020 and our maximum value is 2,378. And again, we've got 4,212 values. So that looks all good. Up until now, a large majority of our data understanding has been to do with actually just reviewing tables and looking at numbers. Now, whenever you're going through the data understanding step, one of the easiest ways to get a feel for your data is to start visualizing it and take a look at what the data actually looks like. So let's go on ahead and do that. In order to visualize our data, we're gonna be using two key libraries. These are matplotlib and seaborn. So let's import these as dependencies. All right, so that's imported. Now the first visualization that we're actually gonna take a look at is the spread of our transactions. So what are the values and distributions of each one of our transactions across our account types? So we can actually do that using probably one of my favorite plots, which is the violin plot. So let's do that. Perfect, so that's our violin plot done. So what we've done is we've passed in our X value, which is going to be our account type, and our Y value, which is going to be our amount. Now that's looking a little bit small at the moment, so we can make that a little bit bigger and add a title as well. So let's do that. Perfect, so that's a little bit easier to read. So we can see now that we've gone and added our title, so account type violin plot, and we've also made it a little bit bigger. All right, so if we take a look at the spread of our transactions, we can see that our revenue accounts tend to sort of average out around our $900 to $800 mark. Our expenses are pretty close, it looks like they're a little bit below. Our asset is looking like it's probably around that value as well. Our liabilities looks like it has a big spread of values, so, and our transactions are sort of spread out around the, what is that, the 900 value to the negative, what is it, 900 value mark. All right, cool, so that tells us a little bit more about our data. Now, what we might choose to do is interrogate our liability account a little bit more, because this is looking like it's, it's probably the least furthest from a normal distribution. So, let's take a look into that. So again, we're just gonna create a violin plot, but now rather than displaying everything, what we might actually choose to do is focus in on our liability accounts. So all we need to do is add in a filter to our data frame. And we're just gonna set it to equal liability. 
Okay, so right now we've got a violin plot for our liabilities, so it looks it's looking a little bit weird. We can also hone in and just take a look at the accounts that sit beneath that. So in order to do that, all we need to do is just change our X variable to be account rather than account type. Alrighty, cool. So it looks like we've only got one account in there. So that's account 4 million and one. So again, uh, if there was a bigger spread of accounts, we might choose to perform some data transformations. For now, we're just gonna leave it um, because we're just getting an understanding of our data. What we might choose to do though is do the same, but perform it on one of our other account types. So let's take a look at uh, revenue, for example. All right, cool. So again, we've got a few different revenue types. So again, rather than choosing account, we might choose to use account description. All right, so this is our product sales. So it looks like we're averaging around the $900 mark, similar for licensing revenue. So this gives us a good feel for the different types of revenue that the particular business that we're looking at has. So we've got product sales, licensing revenue, service revenue, and fee revenue. Perfect, cool. Now the next thing that we might choose to do is take a look at the trend within our data. So up until now, we've been looking at these accounts in isolation. We haven't actually been looking at the trend across the years. So what we can actually do is convert our date column. So if we scroll back up, so we can convert our year and our month into a date column and visualize our data using a period or a date. So the first thing that we're gonna to need to do in order to do that is create a date column within our data frame. So let's go on ahead and do that. Now, in order to create a date column, we're actually gonna need a date. But at the moment, if we take a look at our data frame, we've only got a year and a month column. So what we're gonna to need to do is convert these into a date string. Now for this particular case, we're just gonna append a day column as the first of that particular month. And then what we're going to do is string them together. So we're also gonna to need to convert our month, which is in a string description to an actual month. So we can do that using a month map dictionary. So let's do that first. Perfect, so that's our month map dictionary prepared. Now what this allows us to do is basically enter in a month and get an index return. Perfect, cool. So that's going to allow us to convert each one of these months to a period. So let's go ahead and do that and create a period dimension. All right, so what I'm actually doing here is creating a new column called DF period. And then what we're going to do is loop through each one of the values within our month column and apply this month map transformation. Perfect, cool. So that's now done. So if we actually go and check our data frame again, you can now see that we have a period dimension. If we filter down, so if we check another month, you can see that we've also converted February. Uh, we can try December, for example. Again, we've performed that conversion successfully. Now we're just gonna quickly create another column for our day. So we're just gonna set day equal to one. If we check that, perfect. So we've got our day. So now what we're gonna do is string all of those columns together first up. And then once we've done that, we'll convert it to a date time. Cool, so we've now got a date column. So if we check again, all right, so we've got a date string. Now all we need to do is if we check that D type, so if we check that data type right now, it's not actually a date time column, it's just a string. So if we go and check that, so we can check the data types using the D types function, and you can see our date is still an object. It's not actually a date. So we can quickly convert that using the pandas to date time function. Now, if we check our date types again, you can now see that our date column is now truly a date time column. All right, so cool. So now that all of that data transformation is now done, so we're sort of veering into the data preparation step now, but in this case, it's for our visualization, so it's okay. All right, so now that that data transformation is done, we can now start to visualize by date. So let's go on ahead and prepare some line plot visualizations again with Seaborn. 
So the first one that we're going to do is take a look at revenue because more often than not, revenue seems to be the most seasonal uh, account whenever you're working with businesses. So let's go on ahead and visualize revenue first up. So in this case, we're gonna be using the line plot from Seaborn. So we can do access that using sns.lineplot. And again, we're gonna pass through our X value, our Y value and our data. All right, so that's our basic function. Now, because we wanna filter out and specifically focus in on revenue accounts, again, we're gonna perform a quick filter on our data frame. All right, perfect. So that's our high level plot. So it's not looking that great right now. So what we can do is clean this up a little bit. So specifically, we probably wanna make it a little bit bigger. We wanna remove these estimator bars and we actually wanna see the individual accounts. But I mean, without doing that yet, it does look like we've got a little bit of a trend. So it looks like we start off sort of high-ish, drop a bit lower, then increase. High-ish, drop a little bit lower, then increase. So it looks like there might be some seasonality there. So in this case, we're not gonna be using time series techniques. So we're gonna be using ensemble and linear models, but that's fine. We can factor this in by including our dates as columns. So let's quickly change up this visualization so we can actually clean this up and get a better idea of when this seasonality is actually happening. All right, so that's all of our accounts visualized, but right now it's looking a little bit messy. So what we might choose to do is just focus on one particular account rather than looking at all of them at the same time. So, but again, you can start to see that sort of seasonality. So it starts off high, goes, to, goes lower, then goes high, apart from this particular account here, which seems to be, what is that, service revenue. So again, starts off high, goes up, sort of starts off high, goes up. So if we focus on, let's potentially just look at product sales we might get a better idea of what's happening there. All right, so that's looking a little bit better, a little bit clearer to see what's happening. So it looks like within January, looks like we start off high and then we drop a little bit lower towards the middle months and then again we sort of rise again towards January so it looks like we've got a little bit of seasonality there so let's also take a look at service revenue so that seemed to be bucking the trend and seemed to be doing its own thing all right so it looks like service and revenue might not be as seasonal as our product sales so perhaps if they're operating a consulting firm this might be attached to uh, the number of days or the number of chargeable days in a month. A lot of the time, consulting revenue is attached to the number of chargeable days or chargeable hours. So that again, that's a good thing to know. But it's good to know that our trends do differ slightly between the accounts that we're taking a look at as well. Again, this is just a thing to note as part of our data understanding step. So this is sort of a high level data understanding stage as well. Just keep that in mind. There are more steps that you can perform can dig deeper at additional data sets as well. All right, so the last thing that we're going to do is take a look at correlation between our account. So let's set up our notebook and give it another section. All right, now in our particular case, our accounts are all within one column, which means that if we were to calculate correlation, we actually are not gonna see the correlation between accounts. So if we do that, you can see that we're just sort of getting correlation between our different columns. So year, account, amount, uh, and period. So in our particular case, we wanna check if there's correlation between accounts. So say we've got, so we're taking a look at our service revenue, perhaps our service revenue is attached to our staff costs or has a correlation between our staff costs. We want to be able to capture that relationship. So let's take a look at whether or not we've even got a staff cost column. Yep, so you can see that we've got a staff expenses column. So again, Performing this type of analysis sort of gives us a better overview of if there's any relationship between the accounts that we've actually got. So in order to perform this analysis, we need to reshape our data frame a little bit. So specifically, we wanna have each account have its own column and have the value of that particular account inside of that column as well. 
So let's actually go and reshape our data frame so that we can perform that type of analysis. So in this case, we're just gonna loop through each one of our rows within our data frame, create a bunch of new columns, and if that particular row matches the account column, we're gonna take that amount and put it into that column. So let's go on ahead and do that. All right, so the first thing that we're going to do is create a number of columns per each individual account. Now you can do this really easily using the pd.getDummies function. So you can see that just by running that function, we've got a column for each one of our ind individual accounts. So at the moment, we've got a one showing up in each one of these columns. We actually want the value of that particular transaction to be in this column. So in order to do that, we just need to loop through our regular data frame. If our particular account within our row matches a particular column, we're going to take our amount and sub it out for that particular one. So let's go on ahead and do that. The first thing that we're going to do in order to get started on that is join these two data frames. So we wanna join our dummy data frame with our regular data frame. So let's do that. All right, so that's going to perform our join. So if we run that cell, you can see that we've now joined it. Now, what we wanna do is actually loop through and perform that transformation. All right, so the iter rows function is going to allow us to loop through each one of these rows. So if we actually print out our rows now, you can see that we're actually printing out each one of these rows, but we want some place to actually store the results of this transformation. We don't wanna actually do it in place within our regular data frame because we're gonna to wanna to use that particular data frame for our training later on. So if we create a new dictionary, we can actually store all of our transformed results in that dictionary and then recreate a new data frame from that particular dictionary. So let's do that. All right, so if we take a look at our dictionary now, you can see that we've got one particular key for each row that we wanna transform. So we've got account a million is showing up with 1,344 and so on. All right, now the last thing that we need to do in order to perform this analysis is to just create it, turn it into a data frame and then calculate our correlation. So in order to create a data frame from a dictionary, we just need to use the from dix method and then pass through our dictionary. So if we now take a look at our data frame, you can see that we've got our data frame prepared. But the one problem that we've actually got here is that we want our columns, or we want our rows, which are our accounts, to be our columns, and we also wanna fill in all of these missing values. So you can see that because there's no values at this intersection, it's just showing up as not a number. So we can perform this transformation really, really easily. All we need to do is transpose our data frame and then fill in the missing values with a zero. And you can see we've now converted our rows, which were originally our counts, into individual columns, and we've also filled in our missing values. Now, if we wanted to calculate correlation, all we need to do is type in .core, and we've calculated our correlation. But that's a little bit tricky to visualize. So rather than just looking at a table, we can actually just create a heat map. That seems to be the best way to visualize correlation, so let's go on ahead and do that. So we can create a heat map using the sns.heatmap function and all we need to do is pass through our correlation table to that. So if we copy this, pass it through to our heat map, you can see that we've now got a heat map. Again, let's make it a little bit bigger and let's add a title. Perfect, cool. So it looks like there might be a little bit of a relationship between account, what is that, 3 million and pretty much all of the other accounts. So it's, it's not strong correlation, but it is there. Uh, and likewise, it looks like there's a little bit between account, what is that, 4 million and one. I think that was our liability account. Alrighty, so let's actually check what those accounts are. So if we grab a couple of rows, we can actually see what account 3 million is and what account 4 million and one is. So let's do that. Okay, so that looks to be cash. That kind of makes a little bit more sense. I mean, cash is going to be related to a lot of the things that are happening in the business. So one is probably going to impact the other. Let's take a look at the other account as well. And that's accounts payable. All right, that kind of makes sense. So if you've got changes in cash flow, then you may need to draw down on an overdraft or something. So there might be a bit of a relationship there. All right, and that about wraps up our analysis. So just to quickly summarize, so we took a look at our data, 
calculated to see whether or not there's any missing values. We also looked at our unique values, uh, did a bunch of visualization, and we also looked at our trends. And last but not least, we calculated our correlation. So we did quite a fair bit in this video, but within any data science project, your data preparation and data understanding steps are going to be the large majority of your work. Thanks so much for watching the video. Thanks so much for tuning in guys. Hopefully you found this video useful. If you did, be sure to give it a thumbs up, hit subscribe and tick that bell. And if you've got any questions at all, be sure to drop a mention in the comments below. Peace.